Welcome, Eagles, to another episode of Trad Cat Night Radio. I am Eric Ajewski, founder and owner of Trad Cat Night, the most viewed and followed traditional Catholic website in the world, ladies and gentlemen. A top 20,000 website now. I want to thank you all for all the prayers and support I've received over the past three years as I transitioned out of Defeat Modernism and started this particular apostolate, Trad Cat Night. It truly is Our Lady's and our lords and uh, i'm simply here in the passenger seat folks just like you all are trying to provide you all the latest information as it relates to the church uh, apostasy which was forewarned in scripture it's in tradition it's being uh, over and over again reiterated by the blessed virgin mary throughout the centuries whether it was quito whether it was la salette whether it was the real third secret of fatima which is being covered up by the Masonic Marxist Vatican. Akita even gave this implication. And so I'm doing my best to keep you up to date on all of the latest. Today I'm going to be flying solo here on Trad Cat Night. As many of you as requested, you wanted to hear more talks uh, just coming from me. Of course, we used to do this primarily uh, at the outset of Trad Cat Night, then we started doing special guest radio shows, and wow, we've had some of the best of the best come on to this radio program. Uh, but I'm trying to do more of these throughout the month, maybe like four or five of them. We're essentially going to close out the month uh, with a talk that I'm simply just going to entitle Stigmatist Ruf- Rufini on the Consecration of Russia, and he's an often overlooked, approved uh, stigmatist uh, in the church uh, before Vatican II who had uh, a piece of the puzzle, if you will. From my perspective, Father Kramer has uh, talked to him and uh, I'm going to relay that piece here in a little bit. So we do want to cover uh, a variety of things. We want to cover Francis uh, re-echoing his latest heresy, the ecumenism of blood. I'll break that down for Catholics. Uh Talk a little bit more, follow up to the Louis Varecchio talk, Father Gruner's uh, final warning. Talk a little bit what's on the horizon with the tribulation uh, coming. SSPX soap opera. It seems uh, Bishop Fillet is on the verge of wanting to be recognized by modernist Rome. We'll break that down. We'll do a little Q&A. We'll, we'll get into Garabandal in this two stars colliding which we now see being propagated by the mainstream media uh, and the certain faithless Talmudic Jews now suggesting that the arrival of their Messiah will occur in 2022 or uh, maybe even 2023. We'll, we'll break that down a little bit. And of course, I'm not giving the implication that Garabandal is true. I just want to relay some of what is being said in that message uh, we'll break that down a little bit. I, of course, have a video you can search on YouTube. It's called Trad Cat Night, The Warning, and it should pop up uh, a little segment that I did on that so you can uh, get some further background on that. But again, I, I, the main crux of it will be Mystic Ru- Ruffini, so we'll get into his background and, and break down uh, some things geopolitically, and I will uh, cover how Ruffini fits into this equation uh, according to how I see things uh, developing. So, again, I want to thank you all. Uh, Continue to share articles, continue to share blogs, continue to invite your friends to Tradcat Night. Uh, Alternative news outlets are more readily picking us up, the latest being Veterans Today. So you can see my articles and radio show on a monster website called Veterans Today as well. Click that PayPal button, folks. Again, I can't stress this enough. Sometimes we're very sporadic here. Always good to see new names popping up uh, after you click that PayPal button. But please do get behind us financially. Again, this is Our Lady and Lord's work. And uh, they truly guide this apostolate. And uh, this is, when you donate, it doesn't go to Erica's personal income. We just reinvest it back into the apostolate. And as we get opportunities uh, to talk about the message of Fatima, this will ultimately lead to more and more conversions. It's only logical, or at least potential conversions. Check out my latest talk on Trad Cat Night. You can find it uh, today being posted with SGT Reporter, an absolutely monster 
uh, website. They have something like 150,000 subscribers. You can also just go right to his YouTube channel, SGT Report, and you will locate the link, The Satanic Vatican Deception. I'm going to try to put my media appearances up uh, in advance uh, based upon time. As you know, I, I try to do some ministry too, so I'm just trying to do my best to stay busy, but I'll, I'll try to stay on top of that, So, uh, especially as it relates to the radio shows that I'm going on where there is no follow-up link to it. That way you can listen in live. I can tell you as, as of right now, I'll be on Rural Survival Radio, which is a part of the Republican Broadcasting Network that comes out of... I can't recall whether it's Texas or Missouri now. But anyway, that'll be a live call-in show, folks. So that'll be a good one. Uh, I'll get you a link sometime over the next uh, 72 hours. I'll be with Tim Spencer, and we'll talk a little bit. Uh, and then I'm just I'm lining up another talk with Truth Frequency Radio over there in Europe. Uh, I believe it's Scotland, if I'm not mistaken, with Kev Baker. That'll be the second time I'll be appearing on that show. And today I'm going to be doing some scheduling. So I'll hopefully have out... A general timeline if you will of media appearances uh, for the upcoming week or two in the not so distant future before we get into any of this folks as you know in these dire times uh, we cannot fold we can't simply uh, leave the Catholic Church or leave the Catholic faith on the basis of the things that we're seeing of course we just reported upon today how there was a homosexual priest uh, I believe his name was uh, Father Lynch uh, Father Brendan, something something like that, out there in Ireland, who just married, quote-unquote, his partner. And we so we see these things all around us. It should not dismay us. I mean, we, we know, our Lord warned, that in these end times, in Luke 18, 8, he said, Think ye, shall I find faith upon this earth? And specifically, he, he's talking about the Catholic faith, uh, first and foremost. Of course, eventually, it will break down ulti ultimately into unto uh, whether you are following the true Christ or this false Christ, Maitreya, onto the scene. But generally speaking, he's talking about the Catholic faith. And since the advent of the Second Vatican Council, we have individuals now following a completely different religion, identifying themselves as Catholic, and not realizing or understanding that many of these principles being propagated in the conciliar church have been previously condemned infallibly which simply means folks you can't be in those buildings as much as i would like to be in my local diocese out here in the ohio valley and as much as you you ought have uh that desire of being uh in buildings that are labeled catholic when there is a propagation and a teaching of heresy you can't be there okay so i get that all the time from knuckleheads who suggest i have left the church simply because i won't go into buildings teaching vatican II. remember what saint athanasius said doctor and father of the church they have the buildings we have the faith and he made that proclamation long before any formal declaration by the church so i stand on firm ground again we must please jesus and not man and man in this case does happen to be popes does happen to be prelates does happen to be your local bishop and that's simply how it is, folks. We are in the end times. We are in that universal apostasy, the great revolt, 2 Thessalonians 2, 2 3, that St. Paul warned us of. We're in, that is a preliminary indication of just how close Antichrist Maitreya is. And we're going to get into that in a little bit because he may very well arrive onto the scene in 2023, according to what these uh, certain faithless Jews are suggesting. So let us go before Our Lady and ask for some guidance to this talk. Ask the Holy Ghost to guide us in this talk. Uh, again, through my conversion came about through the Blessed Virgin Mary. Haven't been without a rosary or scapular around my neck uh, for as, as long as I can truly remember, uh, well over uh, five plus years. So run to Our Lady in this time of confusion. She will give you clarity if you are sincere. In trying to arrive at the truth again you're not going to pop onto my website or have a 15-minute conversation with me and think that vatican II is not catholic you've got to put the time and effort into it uh but hey listen in the end pope paul the sixth identified vatican II uh as being representative of the cult of man and folks catholics are not a part of the cult of man that's freemasonry free free masonry 
and Catholicism do not mix. It's oil and water. And thus, we have this new religion, this Novus Orto religion, uh, which essentially is this bridge over into the formalized one world religion, as I have elaborated on on my website and when I do media shows. So let us pray humbly. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. I want everyone to take time out after this talk and visit my friend Chris Gagne's website as it relates to prepping. You all should be prudently prepping at this point. Start getting yourself more off the grid. Generally speaking, if you're on a coastline and you're in a major city, it is a death sentence. And I only say that in a general sense, of course, uh, if it is our Lord's will, uh, we should have that hope that Our Lady would protect us under her mantle. So again, this is why the rosary is uh, so important. But generally speaking, coastlines in major cities are an absolute death sentence as we head into the tribulation, which is not so far off. Uh, if you'd like to schedule me for an interview, if you're listening in today, radio show, if you have your own website, your own YouTube channel, or whatnot, contact me at Apostle of Mary at hotmail.com, and we'll set something up. Again, I'm scheduling for this month. Make sure you subscribe to Trad Cat Night right now. Click the bell or the notification button so you can get these videos sent directly to uh, your own email. Uh, again, as I mentioned, click that PayPal button. Get behind this apostolate. Very few websites left that see Vatican II for what it's worth. Certainly was evil and diabolical. It implemented this impotent humanitarianism that Pope St. Pius X warned of today. Uh, or excuse me, in, in the future that we'll be talking about a little bit today. And uh, again, if you have your own questions, uh, your own concerns, your own articles, if you'd like to speak to me on the phone or set up a, a, a Skype conversation, especially if you're internationally, you can do so. You contact me at apostleofmaryathotmail.com and I'll be sure to get back to you. Now, we'd like to start off this particular radio show for January 30th by rehashing, if you will, recovering one of the latest heresies uh, from, from Francis and the Conciliar Church. And again, listen, folks, the problem runs far deeper than just Francis, as we have said. The enemies of the Catholic Church have long infiltrated the church, even before Vatican II. We know Pope St. Pius X talked about how these enemies were in the heart. They knew the faith very intimately, and they knew how to tweak it and contort it to make it have an appearance of being Catholic, yet we know it not to be Catholic. And so that was in the early 1900s. And so where are these individuals now? Yes, they are now in the upper echelons of the hierarchy uh, of the church. And it's quite simple. You simply do not listen to their teachings. It goes in one ear and out the other. Uh, God will, they will ultimately have to stand before our Lord. And so the measure of Catholicity in our time is tradition. Can we find these things in the pre-Vatican II papal infallible teachings? Whether it be the solemn magisterium or the ordinary magisterium. And again, these errors, these heresies coming from not only the council itself, the quote-unquote council, but the Vatican II Pope simply are representative of the authentic ordinary magisterium, which is liable to error. Most people do not realize that, that popes and prelates can make opinions. They are not robots, fo uh, folks. They are still human. It doesn't mean just because they are Catholic that everything that come out of their mouth is infallible. This is not true. We know this from church history. We have precedents already in the church, as I've mentioned, the Arian crisis. And so we have to be real with ourselves and understand that, objectively speaking, they are enemies of the faith. Francis is an enemy of the Catholic Church and faith. Subjectively, I have no idea why he teaches all of these Freemasonic teachings. Uh, I have an indication, as, as you know, I believe him to be a 33rd degree Freemason. He's giving off all these occultic and Freemasonic hand signs, whether it's the 666 hand sign whether it's uh, you know the, the, the commonly known uh, Luciferian sign, which so many mistake as the I love you sign. 
Uh, so many other signs, too, we could really talk about. But the bottom line with, with, with Francis is it goes in one ear, out the other. He, he's not the true pope, folks, as we've mentioned. We'll develop this as we talk. But Benedict XVI is your pope of Fatima who will flee Rome in the not-so-distant future. Now, it was in the past three days, we reblogged an article from Vatican Insider, again, rehashing this heresy of uh, acumenism of, of blood, and essentially the heresy is that heretics and schismatics now are somehow in the body of Christ. This relates to, just in general, this Masonic doctrine, and that's truly what it is. It is a heresy. It is a part of the forming of the one world religion. I can go back to the Vatican do two documents itself, somewhere in Lumen Gentium, where it talks about how the quote-unquote church is a sign or a symbol of the unity of the whole human family. This is Masonic. There is no teaching in the Catholic Church before Vatican II that ever suggests that the church is representative of the whole human family. Literally, that implies atheists are in the church. Uh, you know, loon bins like me, fundamentalists who see Vatican II for the fraud that it is. I would still be in the church, according to Vatican II. So I always uh, laugh about it with people when, you know, when they call me heretics and schismatics, and I use that, and they kind of just, you know, deer in the headlights. They don't know how to respond. You know why? Because they don't actually take time to read the texts themselves. They don't know how to think for themselves. They simply run to their bishop, who is just as clueless as they are, and they'll get some kind of proclamation, uh, you know, from them. And I have talked with numerous bishops over the years and priests who are absolutely clueless with a capital C. Now make that a capital clueless altogether. As uh, Father Hess, who knew many of these prelates uh, during Vatican II and knew many priests, you know, for all intents and purposes, I mean, he had even stronger words for that. I encourage you all to get to my YouTube channel, click the Vatican II section, click the Father Kramer section, click the Father Hess section, and start to learn. I'm going to upload, I believe, some more Father Hess talks I got from uh, another traditionalist uh, website. Uh, Stephen uh, sent this to me this morning that the audio is kind of low. Uh, we'll probably just have to make do. I'll see if I can enhance it a little bit. But I know many of you have appreciated these Father Hess talks, and again, he taught in Rome. He knew uh, he was under Cardinal uh, Stickler. He's got too many degrees to list. He's got two doctorates, one in canon law, one in Thomistic theology. He's no scrub, if you will. Uh, I certainly believe I have a pretty firm handle uh, you know, on the faith, and I certainly wouldn't want to debate him in, in any uh, area. Uh, but nevertheless, folks, let's just get right into it again. So the Conciliar Church and uh, Francis deems that anyone who dies for the name of of Christ, or quote on uh, you know quote unquote being a Christian, uh, would die and essentially go to heaven. That's the implication. That's not true. This is not what the church has taught uh, since the beginning. So this is a whole new concept of what it is to be well, not only Christian because we have to go back to what Saint Athanasius said directly. This is a direct quote of his, uh, where he taught that if anyone deviated from Catholic tradition altogether, that that they ought to be stripped of that name Christian altogether. So I'll go around and, and quite adamantly say that Protestants are, are not Christians, and the reality is they're, they're really not. They're not in the true fold. So if they're in a heretical, uh, you know, if they're teaching heresy or they're in some type of schismatic church, they are, are not in the body of Christ, folks. And again, this ties in with the, the formalization of the one world religion coming. When the false prophet steps onto the scenes, he's simply going to formalize what is already being taught in principle right now. And so we have that disagreement with Sede Vacantis. We don't say it's the apostate church yet. We would definitely say it's the new heterodox church of Rome. But very soon, Rome will lose the dogma of faith uh, altogether, and there'll be some some form of you know invalid and illicit quote-unquote ex cathedra coming from this false prophet character, something for us to uh, consider. So we've had Francis, within this past year, being on record of saying this, the blood of our Christian brothers is a testimony that cries out. It doesn't matter if they are Catholics, Orthodox, Copt, or Lutherans. They are Christians. The blood is the same. The blood confesses Christ. That is not true. That is heresy. 
And again, we always have to go back to this. We're getting, there's many traditionalists who are getting hung up on the latest apostolic exhortation and, 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 and indicting that the schism is on the horizon, and it is the formal schisms on the horizon. But we have to understand the conciliar church is already teaching heresy. It already is heretical, as Archbishop Lefebvre said, and it is already in material schism. So the conciliar church, if you will, okay, needs to be handled just as we're handling the Greek or uh, Russian Orthodox churches. This is why, ladies and gentlemen, you cannot satisfy your Sunday obligation in any church teaching Vatican II. What they are teaching in the conciliar church since Vatican II is not Catholicism with a C. It's a Catholicism with a K. It's a phony, watered-down version. If Budweiser represents the Catholic faith for you know, the sake of analogy... Vatican II represents Bud Light. Bud and Bud Light are two different things. They're trying to pass it off as Budweiser, but we know it's watered down. It's, it's not the true flavor. It's a different Baskin-Robbins flavor, if you will. And that is why, as a Catholic, you must stand nobly. You must understand what these principles are, and certainly I don't have time to go th through them all in this particular talk. you got to spend time on Trad Cat Night and uh, on my YouTube channel to arrive at all of these erroneous teachings. This is just one of them. Uh, and we knew this day would come. Now, Francis, well, let's see what the Solemn Magisterium has to say in relation to what Francis has said in, in relation to ecumenism of blood. Are these heretics and schismatics on the basis of them being quote-unquote Christians in the body of Christ? Uh, will they be seen as martyrs? Do, does the church truly see them as martyrs? And the answer is no. Uh, and again, this is another proof that the conciliar church uh, is not the Catholic church. Now we have Pope Innocent III from the Fourth Lateran Council, Constitution 1. This was in 1215. This is ex cathedra. There is indeed one universal church of the faithful outside of which nobody is saved at all. So if you're out there and you think Lutherans, objectively speaking, can obtain salvation, you're wrong. Lutherans have no direct apostolic uh, succession. We know, we can prove via historical text that the Catholic Church is the only church that Jesus Christ started. And we also know from tradition, too, that people would depart from the faith. We knew that churchmen would depart from the faith in these end times. It's proof of where we are. Pope Boniface uh, the Eighth in Unum Sanctum 1302, another ex cathedra statement. Again, this is infallible. If you disagree with what I'm about to say, you are no more a Christian than the Delhi Lama is a Christian. With faith urging us, we are forced to believe and hold to the one holy Catholic and that apostolic and that we firmly believe and simply confess this church outside of which there is no salvation nor the remission of sin. Furthermore, we declare, say, define, and proclaim that every human creature, uh, that they be absolute uh, necessity for salvation, that they be subject to the Roman pontiff. Uh, we have Clement V and the Council of Vienne, another ex cathedra statement. Since, however, uh, there is both regulars and seculars for superiors and subjects, for exempt and non-exempt, one universal church outside of which there is no salvation. Council of Florence, Eugene the Fourth, fourteen thirty nine, another infallible statement. Whoever wishes to be saved needs to hold the Catholic faith unless each one preserves this whole and inviolate. He will, without a doubt, perish in eternity. That means if you are picking and choosing from what the Church has taught infallibly, you're going to end in hell. You won't stand a chance, objectively speaking. And again. Who are the Protestants? Is it us? Is it Eric who simply will take something from tradition and say it and now is deemed as an outsider? We must ask the question, who has changed? Is it me? Or did the Second Vatican Council change things? Did Francis change things? Who are the true Protestants? And that is the difference between me and Luther and a, and a real traditionalist and a real Catholic and Luther. Luther simply taught his own opinions, which you can't find in tradition. I reiterate tradition and am seen as a Protestant when in reality... Those in the Vatican are the Protestants. And we know this for a, a reference on that. Read the book AA 1025, where this uh, Marxist, this one uh, Marxist who wrote memoirs, who obviously uh, was a higher up 
uh, in the hierarchy of the church talked about this. They needed to flip-flop things. They needed the hierarchy to begin to preach Protestantism and make those seem uh, to be on the outside, if you will, who were the real Catholics. And by the way, Pope St. Pius X said the same thing when he was warning about this one world religion to come. That, you know, I'm paraphrasing here, of course, that if we didn't kind of follow along in false obedience, we'd be seen as outsiders, as outside the clique. And f folks, truth is not a democracy. Be you know, we have 95 plus percent of people who profess Catholicism who simply aren't Catholic on the objective level. That is how dangerous a time we live in. When people literally think what they're following is Catholicism, and it is not. These principles have been long condemned, as I mentioned, and false obedience doesn't cut it. Faith precedes obedience. If any prelate is not keeping the faith, you are obligated to not follow him. That is church teaching. We simply have to point it out, make this visible. We cannot remain silent any longer. Now we have at the Council of Florence again. In 1441, this is the more famous quote that really rattles a lot of nerves. If you do not believe in this statement, you are not a Christian and you are outside the body of Christ and you stand no chance of salvation. This is ex cathedra. This is infallible. The Holy Roman Church firmly believes, professes, and preaches that all those who are outside the Catholic Church, not only pagans, but also Jews or heretics and schismatics, cannot share in eternal life and will go into the everlasting fire, which was prepared for the devil and his angels, unless they are joined to the church. And I must make note there, that's at least implicitly enjoined with the church. There is baptism of desire. There is baptism of blood, with the Phineites rejects, which the Phineites do reject, and they are heretics as well. They are truly Protestants. So they must do so before the end of their lives, uh, so that the unity of this ecclesiastical body is of such importance that only for those who abide in it uh, do the church's sacraments contribute to salvation and do fast, almsgiving, and other works of piety and practices of the Christian militia to produce eternal rewards, and that nobody can be saved no matter how much he has given away in alms, and even if he were to shed his blood in the name of Christ unless he is pre preserved in the bosom and the unity of the Catholic Church. Now that's a direct uh, difference between what Eugene IV says and uh, anti-Pope Francis says. He says even if you shed your blood in the name of Christ, if you're outside the unity of the Catholic Church, you're going to hell. So that's why, you know, we see, you know, it's we got to be a little careful here and be compassionate. You see these, you know, heretics over in the Middle East being, you know, smashed by uh, ISIS and, you know, the mainstream media is, of course, which is predominantly Protestant, you know, puts it out there that they're, you know, they're martyrs for the church. Well, what church are you talking about? It's not the Catholic church. They didn't die for Christ. And again, we can't judge the interior of anyone's heart. We can only talk on the objective level. We simply can't label them as a martyr for the church. I don't know the interior state of their soul whether they truly were invincibly ignorant or not that's something we can't judge okay which is also infallible by the church but again stay on the surface level and on the objective nature of things we have leo v fifth fifth lateran council in 1516 ex cathedra once again for regulars and seculars prelates and subjects belong to the one universal church outside of which no one can be saved pius the ninth council of trent 1565 this is the this true Catholic faith outside of which no one can be saved. I now profess and truly hold. Pope Benedict the Fourteenth in 1743 in the profession of faith. This faith of the Catholic Church without which no one can be saved, and which of my own accord I now profess and truly hold. Pius the Ninth, Vatican I, Session Two, 1870. This true Catholic faith outside of which no one can be saved. Now, what about some of the saints? What did they have to say? Do heretics and schismatics who die for Christ, are they to be considered martyrs? Well, let's have a look. St. Cyprian, heretics or schismatics being placed outside the church and cut off from the unity in charity, even though one should be slain for the name of Christ, could not be crowned in death. I think I'll stick with the infallible teachings of the church and what the saints have to say on who is truly deemed to be a Christian and who is truly to be recognized as a martyr. Francis the Freemason 
simply teaches otherwise. St. Augustine says, There are also some amongst the heretics who flatter themselves with the claims of martyrdom, but not all who submit their bodies to suffering, even to flames, are to be considered as having shed their blood for the sheep. Rather, they may have shed it against the salvation of their, own, uh, of their sheep. For the apostle says, If I should deliver my body to be burnt and have no charity, it profits me nothing. And how can they have the faintest charity in him, who, though shown to be at fault, yet has no love for that unity for which the Lord chose to recommend? Our Lord chose for Christians to be of one body, one heart, one mind. When you are a heretic, when you start teaching against what the church, the true church has always taught, you break that bond of unity. Thus, you break the bond of charity. You are outside the true church. You are severed. You live in mortal sin. You are broken off from the true body of Christ. St. Augustine continues, Indeed, so long as you remain outside the church and severed from the fabric of unity and the bond of charity, you will be punished with everlasting chastisement, even if you were burned alive for the sake of Christ. Man, what a terrible way to go. A heretic who obstinately denies uh, the church's infallible teachings on purgatory or on Mary, who would burn themselves, allow themselves to be burnt alive for Christ, will suffer the eternal flames. That's a reality, folks. That is a fact. We have St. Cyprian. He who is not armed by the church for battle cannot be fit for martyrdom. So a reiteration. St. Cyprian again, baptism of blood cannot profit a heretic unto salvation because there is no salvation outside the church. Yet what does Francis teach, as I mentioned? He teaches completely the opposite. St. John Eudes states, For if you are not in his grace and love, even though you were to suffer martyrdom, it would be useless both for God's glory and own sanctification. So here you have the 95% plus say, well, yeah, Francis said this or that. I will stick with that. Okay, you stay with being a heretic then. You choose. Tradition of the church, which the real martyrs died for and were pulled apart by lions and crucified up by upside down. If you want to deviate from tradition and stand before Christ and play the whole human respect game, well, this is what everyone else is doing. This is what all my friends and family are doing. This is what my bishop is saying. Hey, March down that path and see where it gets you. You step outside of tradition, as St. John Chrys Chrysostom says, say no more. That's it. It's a done deal. We are dealing with a universal apostasy here, folks. St. Alphonsus Maria Liguori states, we should not forget that the devil has his martyrs and that he infuses into them a false constancy. It is not the punishment but the cause that makes the martyr. That is the confession of the true faith. Do heretics, do Lutherans confess the, the true faith? Do those in the Russian or Greek Orthodox churches confess the true faith? No, they do not. Therefore, their cause is erroneous. If you do not have the proper norm of faith, you do not remain in a state of grace. You are outside of charity. You are outside the walls of charity. St. Pachian said, Grant that the heretic suffered somewhat, nevertheless he was put to death. And even if he had been put to death, he would not have been crowned because of it. Why? Because he was outside the peace of the church, outside concord, outside of the mother of whom he ought be a part of. In closing, St. Irenaeus of Lyons states, True martyrs are found only in the Catholic Church. Again, this goes back to our premise of how the conciliar church has changed the notion of who, who's even in the Catholic Church anymore. Every, I mean, according to their, their own teachings that I mentioned, everyone's in the church. So quit calling me a heretic and schismatic because I'll show you the text where it says I'm in the church no matter what. <laughs> oh, folks, the madness of our times, as St. Anthony the Great state stated, uh, you know, it's just unbelievable. People have gone mad and they're labeling other people as mad and they've just lost all sight of true doctrine. I believe we will move on from that. I hope you all have gotten a chance to check out some of my more recent talks with some traditionalists, whether it's been uh, Dr. Peter Hornowski, whether it's been Cornelia Ferrara, also Louis Vereccio, uh this week. You know, we kind of talked about how important the message of Fatima is, but the need for the consecration of Russia. And uh, Father Gruner, Father Amorth, 
uh, both basically were giving warnings that, you know, these chastisements are more imminent now. You know, the tribulation is more imminent now, folks. Folks, It's not, you know, like a decade or so away. Um, I will develop this thesis as we go along. But if truly this Antichrist figure, Maitreya, is to arrive in 2023, and they on their end say there will be a fiery trial period before then, meaning the tribulation will start, what we would commonly call the tribulation from a Christian point of view, that means all hell is going to break loose in the next five years. And it's going to affect everyone. You see here in the United States, we sit back, we still, uh, you know, we have our TVs, we've got the our large bank accounts, we still have heat in the winter we have all these luxuries around us and and we think that we're untouched now and they're not paying attention to the big picture as if you know this coming economic collapse is is not going to uh, affect them as if these false flags which are coming to this country are not going to affect them uh as if uh you know as these muslims uh start invading more more of our country which will still happen even though trump is uh taking some preventative measures against it, it ultimately will happen. Uh, it still will affect you. This clash between the liberals and conservatives in, in this country will affect you. Listen, folks, when martial law is ultimately disclosed, there will be no rule or law really anywhere, not only in the United States, but in the world. These revolutions will be worldwide. Distress of nations, as our Lord said, it's going to affect you. So quit acting like it's not going to affect you. Start preparing yourself spiritually now as you ought have been. Chastisement or not, you should be preparing your soul now. What are you doing in your interior life? How is your prayer life? Do you have a close devotion to Our Lady? Are you staying as close as you can to the traditional Catholic sacraments? Are you now openly taking a stand against Vatican II? publicly admonishing priests or even your bishop which is necessary you must do so for the sake of their salvation that is true charity we have to remember even paul admonished peter and he was a subordinate we must do so in charity and do so publicly chess pieces are falling into place for world war three my friends we just put up another article today Coming from, well, it was mainstream media, I believe it was Yahoo, reporting how Russia is now solidifying themselves in the Arctic area, in Antarctica. They're making strategic military moves. They're building their defense mechanisms, if you will, over there. Uh, in Europe, we have U.S. and NATO building up their forces uh, along the Ukraine-Russia border. We have Syria obviously taking a bold stand in Syria. We have out there in the Far East, uh, we now, as of this last week, China putting up some defensive measures along the Russia-China border. We, it's, it's all over the place, folks. I mean, the, the country is being divided up, being divvied up, if you will, kind of like that board game Axis and Allies. World War III is being staged. It is going to happen. Uh, I've had several prominent guests on who seem to suggest it's not going to happen. It's going to happen. It's in Scripture. It is in Catholic prophecy. It is a part of the, the message of Fatima. Ultimately, Russia is going to lash out. They are going to say enough is enough at a certain point. And this ties in with what we're talking about today. The consecration of Russia will be done late. Hasn't been done now, and it will be done late. So please don't come at me, you know, you know, brushing what we have to say off. Ah, this isn't going to affect me as Father Malachi Martin. It doesn't matter if you are 20,000 leagues beneath the sea. You will be affected. And as Planet X gets closer, which is in Catholic prophecy, which is implied in the apocalypse, we will even be hit by a comet at a certain point called Wormwood. It is going to affect you. If you're on a coastline, it's going to affect you in the sense that you're not going to be around. St. Hildegard talked about this same comment. I've had prominent ex-military high-ranking officials such as John Moore come on and say they have seen maps of this thing back in the 70s. And it's maps that other people who have studied X have come to the conclusion on. Get a couple hundred miles off of coastlines and get out of major cities. Pretty simple. 
Now, if I can, if you have any questions on, on a more general timeline of, of things to come, again, none of us truly know. We can only speak in more general terms based upon what we know from s- Scripture and tradition and then just Catholic prophecy. Uh, you know, try to do our best, but certainly none of us should should have dates, although we were given a date on this one star sign that we're going to talk about, which is absolutely pivotal. I mean, this is the most important piece of information that I've put out over the past three years because I've been warning you all to pay attention to mainstream uh, media propaganda concerning Maitreya's star sign, and now these Jews are talking about it. Unbelievable. Now, the latest with the SSPX soap opera, if you will. And I don't want to belabor the point. But in short, if you are truly following the principles that Archbishop Lefebvre left behind, then you ought not be attending society masses. It's as simple as that. Lefebvre truly taught that we can have no sort of recognition or agreement from modernist Rome without Rome's conversion first. It's about principle. The false traditionalists want to make it otherwise. Yeah, let us be recognized now. We'll work things out in the future. Well, if you think that is going to please Jesus, I don't want to be in your crowd. I'm not going to stand before Jesus having broke uh, very sound and logical principles that you simply don't shake the hand of the enemy. Whether they seem to be of good intent or not, who does that? Who wants to shake hands with certain individuals who openly say their goal is to conciliarize you? Literally for, for you to teach heresy. We've even had Mueller said eventually the society would just accept the heresies of collegiality, religious liberty, and ecumenism. Do I want to do business with those types of people? Would you, if you owned a business, put money, if you will, into these types of people? And for the sake of this analogy, you know, would I want to be handing over people who are coming to my society to these people saying, yeah, these guys aren't so bad. No, 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 folks. Everyone has their own line in the sand, but if you think that's logical, that's in part why we are resistance and we want nothing to do uh, with the new SSPX in that sense. It's just, it's not logical at all. We, we've caught Bishop Filet with his hand in the cookie jar uh, all too often. Uh, a lot of propaganda coming out on his end. You can simply search uh, Google, type in Tradcat Knight, then Bishop Filet or Tradcat Knight Neo SSPX. And we've been exposing now the Neo Society, who's, who's turned liberal now. And again, on the basis that since 2012, the Society now says, although there's error in Vatican II, we can still accept Vatican II. On the basis of that alone, this is my opinion. You ought not be attending society chapels. Bottom line. Now I know what this is going to do, and I've, I've made this point before. With this, what seems to be the next move of the society, you're going to see an awful lot of people simply leave. I mean, they will join our ranks. They'll try to find traditional uh, independent chapels, or, you know, resistance uh, chapels. You must understand there's, there's traditionalists outside of the society. Uh, so it'll break them down in this sense, but then they're going to start gaining some of just the loosey-goosey types whose doctrines are, are, are worse than what we're seeing coming out of the society uh, as of late. So they're going to get, you know, that movement or that group is just going to get worse and worse. And again, folks, you know, everyone has their own line in the sand. If you think you can accept Vatican II and this somehow pleases Jesus and that you think you can step inside those buildings, go for it. Uh, We must remember during the Aryan crisis, I've always pointed this out to pseudo-trads like John Salza, who just don't seem to get this whatsoever. Uh, On the basis of heresy, you can't be in any building, even though it's labeled uh, quote-unquote Catholic. We need not wait for any formal recognition of that. You know, what do you do in a situation where you got 95-plus percent of the bishops holding to heresy, as Blessed Anna Emmerich uh, implied in her visions? What do you do? We sit around and wait for some sort of formal declaration? And this is somehow going to please Jesus by us continuing to commune with these individuals? No. So we already have that as church precedents laid down for us as how to act. Now, on top of that, people cannot, uh, they truly can't refute what I have to say on the level of compromise. There were individuals during the Aryan crisis who would not enter into impious or compromised buildings as recorded by the early church fathers, St. Basil included. And they were never condemned by the church. So when I say, you ought stay, 
outside of the SSPX uh, chapels on the basis that they do formally now say you can accept Vatican II, you can't blame me. I mean, if you actually really think that you can accept Vatican II, I, I won't want to do business <laughs> with you to begin with. And, uh, you know, we're, we're never going to coexist in that sense. And I simply don't want to hear your arguments for that matter. But the bottom line is, uh, you know, this is something that we have to deal with. It's, you know, an issue which has divided a lot of families, of course. It is sad. We have to continue to pray the rosary. There's no doubt about it. You know, I try to do my best. And as many of you know, I, I invite guests onto my radio show of all different backgrounds. Uh, you know, Louis Vareccio is one. He was, he was pro filet. Well, you know, we try to find common points and, and move forward with that. We're, we're just not ever going to agree upon that. And I wouldn't know why someone like Louis would even uh, be pro filet at this point because he holds the position now. Francis is an anti-pope too. So that's the other argument that I have. Why is filet even talking with Francis when he's not even the true pope? He's not. He doesn't have jurisdiction. Rome is also universalist. Again, it's implied everyone is in the church. Everyone who, who just gives an eyeball test outside of the argument that I just stated with uh, the society accepting Vatican II uh, should be able to see uh, that they are Catholic in that sense. Okay? So there need not be any you know, recognition by people who are not holding the faith. That doesn't make any sense. If they're universalists, and they're implying everyone's in the church, then what does it matter what, what they say about us? I mean, goodness, I've said this, and it's not to be comical. If I had an hour-long talk with Francis and I demonstrated all of his heresies and showed what tradition said, what all the papal infallible teachings are, and he came up to me and said, Eric, you know, uh, you know what I'm teaching is, is certainly Catholic. You, you know, you're misunder misunderstanding this is the hermeneutics of continuity it's a deeper understanding now and he looked at me and said yeah you know you're a catholic i th that's not a good sign folks <laughs> okay because universalists are not catholics they, they don't think like catholics modernists they're not seeing through catholic lenses so that would be that would be a bad thing if after an hour francis were to, to to identify me as catholic because he himself isn't it's, that's just the bottom line. And you've got knuckleheads like Patrick Madrid and all these other individual individuals out there writing books. You know, are you are, are you more Catholic than the Pope? Yeah. Yeah, I am. Because I'm following tradition. You know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to look at the infallible teachings of the, ch the church, condense them, follow them. You see a Pope or a council or anyone going against uh, this tradition, which is infallible. We have to remember scripture and tradition both compose the word of God in the Catholic faith. Then we say, no, then we are more Catholic than the Pope. What, 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 what kind of idiotic piece is that? And I've never read that book, but goodness, talk about a waste of time. I mean, that, that, that whole premise isn't even Catholic. Um, so I won't belabor the point. on. I just wanted to raise this because I know many people are going to be uh, sending emails. You already have begin to, to send me emails on what I think about the situation. And my position hasn't changed, you know. Bishop Filet has, has stabbed the back of Archbishop Lefebvre. You know, he's, he's joined these other pseudo-trads who think they're really solidified now on social media, whether it's The Remnant or 1 Peter 5 or any of these other uh, websites. And uh, can't go that route, folks. It's, it's as simple as that. We must, we must remain as is. We're not saying, we're not state of a contest. I haven't said that there hasn't been a Pope, you know, since uh, John the 23rd. The bottom line is, is where there is heresy, you must keep your distance. You must keep your distance. This is church teaching. Now, again, that's generally speaking. If, if you have a situation where, you know, in your local diocese, you and I, I know from friends that I, I graduated from from Franciscan. I mean, this was some years back. Who in different areas of the country are, are now traditionalists, and they say, "Yeah, you know, my my priest is still considered a part of the conciliar church, if you will, part of the mainstream." But you know, he doesn't say the new mass. He rejects it. He's not teaching Vatican II. He's teaching out of you know the Catechism of Pius the Tenth or something. Then, then go for it. I mean, I'm not a state of a contest, and, and and would tell you that that priest is not a priest, uh, even though. You know, we disagree along those lines. And I would say it's imprudence that these priests ought be uh, reconditionally uh, ordained, if you will. 
so much to consider. I know it's racking your brain. Sometimes I sit up at night and I just, I just wonder. I mean, I, I know a lot of people are falling into despair, worry, and doubt, and you truly shouldn't. Again, as I mentioned on Louis Vareccio, so if you're truly just confused, you just simply say a nightly prayer to Jesus and you say, Lord, listen, I'm not the next St. Thomas Aquinas and none of us truly are. Uh, I, I'm not trying to not be Catholic. I'm not trying to be a heretic. So please uh, make it clear to me as to what direction to go for me, for my salvation, for my family. And it will become clear over time. Uh, I have no doubt about it. It became very clear to me once I started looking into uh, the matter. And it will for you. But it's going to take you time. It's not going to take you 15 minutes, as I mentioned. It's going to take you some months. And God bless you if you do start spending time on my website and after three days, you come to the conclusion that we have. I mean, that would be just an, an unbelievable grace, and I will pray for that grace uh, for everyone. But needless to say, uh, don't don't fetter. You know, d don't think that uh, God has abandoned you in that sense, because He hasn't. He truly hasn't. Now we must move on, folks. Uh, we're already what what 50 minutes into this particular broadcast, and I wanted to cover two more sections. So this radio show will probably go closer to an hour and a half today i've been trying to keep these around an hour kind of a question and answer session i must preface this particular segment by telling you i am not at all advocating or propagating garabandal garabandal is wow i mean it's a very hot topic amongst the traditionalist catholic community i've seen you know 50 percent or so well i shouldn't say that i would probably say more people who follow Trad Cat Night, just traditionalists in general, actually don't believe that it's an authentic um, revelation, if you will. But I wanted to point out, because this is this is kind of eerie. We had this past week, as I made mention, the mainstream media and these certain faithless Jews who are awaiting their false messiah, who we call the biblical antichrist, who in my long study on the, on the subject is Maitreya. You can get to his website by simply simply going to Google, type in Maitreya, M-A-I-T-R-E-Y-A, -E and then Share International behind it. And you'll get to his website. I think it's like shareinternational.org. It should be the first link there. Start studying his page because everything that scripture and tradition says about this character lines up perfectly with what he says in his apologetics and I don't have time to get into it for this broadcast. We have to move along. But what they are saying, these Jews, is that in 2022, a new star sign, this is coming from Breaking Israel News, a new star sign uh, to appear in the night sky, which will essentially usher in the arrival of the Messiah. Five years from now, the light from the ancient collision of two stars will reveal a brand new star in the night sky. According to G Jewish esoteric sources, this is pr precisely the celestial phenomenon which will accompany the new, which will accompany the arrival of the quote unquote Messiah. Now, this new star <coughs> expected to appear in 2022 in a blaze of light called a nova will be the brightest heavenly body visible. In the nighttime sky for six months, it will be the first time in recorded history that a celestial event of this kind will be witnessed by the naked eye. Now, this is interesting because this is what some of the uh, warnings out of uh, Garibandal uh, have been suggesting. And someone can correct me, you know, send me an email. I don't know if there's other unapproved sources that are saying the same. Again, I stay away from advocating anything that's unapproved. That's why you only hear me say I'm advocating, you know, the message of Fatima. I'm not advocating Garibandal when I'm speaking on this right now. I'm just putting it out there that I find it interesting that this was put out there. And again, we'll see if there are conversions to the Catholic faith or the New Age religion after this event occurs. Because Antichrist Maitreya, as I've mentioned to you, is going to claim this phenomenon. That was between 61 and 65 that apparently over 2,000 apparitions of the Virgin Mary appeared at Garabandal, which is in uh, north northwest Spain, for those who are not Catholic and who have no idea what Garabandal is. Four girls age uh, seven, uh, age 11 and 12 were revealed these four warnings, if you will. Now, and it was basically talking about a, a warning uh, that would happen. 
It would be experienced by everyone on Earth, and it would basically be like a last-ditch effort to call humanity to amend its behavior and return to God. Uh, Now, this is like a direct quote here from the Sears. Uh, The warning is something that will be seen in the air everywhere in the world and is immediately transmitted into the interior of souls. It will last for a little bit of time. I think it's been suggested under five minutes, but it will seem like a very long time because of its of effect within us it would be like fire uh it will not burn our flesh but we f- it will f- feel but we will feel it bodily and interiorly excuse me the warning pay attention to this this is where i'm getting at the warning appears like two stars which will crash and make a lot of noise and a lot of light but they don't fall i mean that perfectly describes what i've just said these two stars apparently in ancient times you know have collided and it's just awaiting to arrive in our time so to speak and this is where we get this illumination of conscience and again it's like which way do we go with this because Maitreya is talking about this he's actually claiming it too so that's why a lot of people will suggest that uh Garibandal is diabolical it's for me I just I'm putting this information out there for you to discern I'm not saying either way on this now um, <clears throat> again, yes, it is quite often that they talk about these two stars colliding. Uh, if I could get to some of the question and answer, I believe I have, this is actually from Garabandal itself. Cause many of you may be running into this for the first time. Again, this radio show reaches non-Catholics as well. This is probably what I'm going to be talking about over the next week or so when I make radio show appearances. But in 1965, it was asked to Conchita, uh, will the warning be a visible thing or an interior thing or both? Uh, she answered, the warning is a thing that comes directly from God and will be visible throughout the entire world in whatever place one might be. And again, this is exactly what these Jews are saying. Now, this this new star sign, by the way, which will eventually be there in the sky, this is something that the New Age has been warning about, or not warning about, but getting people prepped for Again, much like in mockery how the three magi followed the star of Bethlehem, it's going to be in counterfeit fashion. As a matter of fact, on their website, they actually will tell you that this star of Bethlehem was a spaceship. So what I've been warning you is when the mainstream media starts really propping up the UFO propaganda, and they're not UFOs, folks, they're demons in the air, they're going to say that this star sign that stands behind these two initial stars colliding will be a spaceship our space brothers are here to save humanity and this is going to be at the lowest point and that's all i'm saying if they're giving us a date now of 2022 2023 that means all hell has to break loose in this world i mean on every level everything so you better start be you know you better start preparing yourself right now, especially for your your family. And I'm not just talking about spiritually. I'm talking about practically too. I'm talking about prepping. I'm talking about getting your communities aware of these things. <coughs> Question: This is from the Garibandal website. Will the warning reveal personal sins to every person in the world and to people of all faiths, including atheists? Answer: Yes. The warning will be like a revelation of our sins. Um, and it will be seen and experienced by believers and non-believers of any religion whatsoever. And again, this is where we get herky-jerky. Is this going to convert people to Maitreya and the New Age religion, or is this ultimately going to draw people back to tradition and back to the Catholic faith? I can't answer that question. We're not there yet. But obviously, if if it does promulgate conversions, if it shows you how you are sinning against the Sacred Heart of Jesus... If it shows you that we have deviated from the Catholic faith, then who who's going to argue that it's authentic? Again, we're going to have to see the, the fruit from this particular event. Um, question, will the warning be recognized by the world as a direct sign from God? Answer, certainly. And for this reason, I believe it's impossible that the world could be so hardened as to not change. We actually know that people aren't going to change. I mean, uh, eventually, listen, Planet X is on its way. So people aren't going to change. Uh, There's no stopping it now, as Father Malachi Martin said, who was well aware 
uh, that Planet X was inbound. And again, for those who are new, it is in Catholic prophecy, approved Catholic prophecy, Marie Julie Jeheni, who was forewarned by our Lord directly, told us of this radiant planet, which was inbound. And again, this we can't mistake this. This is not Planet X that I'm talking about. This These two star signs colliding and this other star sign, which will be pitched as a spaceship by the New World Order slash New Age. It's two different things. Planet X comes years after in reality. Um, Conchita was asked if you can explain the statement that during the warning we will know ourselves and the sins we've committed. <coughs> Excuse me. She basically said the warning will be a correction of the conscience of the world. And again, you know, which way our conscience is pulled? Are they pulled into the New World Order religion? You know, as, as if we are offending Maitreya by not joining his uh, his team, so to speak, and, you know, basically making the suggestion that people who don't eventually take this mark of the beast are not corrected. Again, I don't know because we're not there yet. I don't want to belabor the, the point. I think you understand basically where I am going at uh, with that particular area. Uh, I just found it very interesting. And again, if, if you've got more information as to other either approved seers or unapproved seers. I mean, I'll take a look at the unapproved ones. Not like I'm going to promote it or anything, but I would just be curious uh, to kind of see the details that they're saying. Again, there's another false seer out there, Maria Divine Mercy, who's outright teaching heresy, uh, you know, and implying that there are, you know, these other sects are okay and other religions are okay. I've, I've weaved through enough of her uh, material to know that she is uh, certainly false, even though she suggests, too, that Francis is an anti-pope and Benedict XVI is a true pope. That is, in by no means makes her uh, a true seer. So I wanted to put that out uh, there to you all. Again, the date, 2022 in my research, it'll be the last week of December in mockery, if you will, or counterfeit fashion of the star of Bethlehem. And certainly something for us to consider as it falls under Luke 21:25. Uh, signs in the skies, if you will, and uh, some good information there for you all who are unaware of that. Now, if I can, we're going to kind of finish out here, kind of tying uh, this all together as it relates to the consecration of Russia. And for those modernists out there, for those phony baloney Catholics who think that the consecration was already done, it was not done. The real Sister Lucia made mention of that. There was an imposter sister to see that was ultimately implanted, and I believe she said that it was done or something along that lines. It was not done, and she was not the real uh, sister to see, in my opinion. Uh, Our Lady still awaits this consecration. A consecration to the world is not the same thing as a specific consecration of Russia. So I've always made mention of this. If, if your mother was at the dinner table and, and you are the child and she said please go bring the table forks and you went back and you got forks knives spoons and you brought them to the table what is your mother going to tell you no this is not what i told you to bring to the table i asked you forks not everything okay it wasn't specifically done as mentioned and so we still await this consecration of russia and we have proof that it truly wasn't done because Russia is not converted to the Catholic faith. It's only logical if the consecration was done, they would be Catholic right now. And the Russian Orthodox Church, as good as the signs we've been seeing from Russia and Putin, uh, and kind of a revitalization of just traditionalism altogether in that country, they are by no means converted. Okay, we could get into how the Russian Orthodox Church has connections with the KGB and communism. Still, there's still a good number of traditionalists suggesting that, you know, Russia, you know, Russia still might be communist, kind of hiding behind this traditionalism. Uh, there are people who would hold to that opinion. My point is this: Benedict the Sixteenth is your true pope. He is the Pope of Fatima. He's the long-awaited pope from Catholic prophecy who will flee Rome with some conservative cardinals who are not converted at this point because your Cardinal Burks and your Bishop Schneiders have still yet to come out against Vatican II and the New Mass. So they still need conversion and repentance too. Uh, so that's why we have to continue to pray for them. 
Uh, eventually, as these chastisements are happening, as things are unveiling, the economic collapse happens, and all of these epidemics uh, increase, uh, all the crises kind of explode. We'll have uh, civil unrest all over the place. As I mentioned, Italy will go through a massive red revolution. Uh, they'll eventually take off, and who's ever left out of that crop, if you will, once the formal schism happens or occurs, th you know, that those minority cardinals, because it's going to be a minority when you study Catholic prophecy, it suggests about two-thirds go with the uh, Rome, with fallen away Rome, if you will, and the one-third, like your Cardinal Burks and your, your Bishop Schneiders, will eventually lean the way of, of Benedict XVI and, and be on the run. Eventually, Benedict XVI uh, will be killed, building up to a point here, because it's very, very important. Because what uh, Antonio Ruffini said was, was that it would be done by the successor of Benedict the Sixteenth eventually, and I'll get to that in a minute. But to kind of lay a backdrop for Antonio Ruffini, again, he was a mystic stigmatist in the Church, uh, who essentially got his blessing from the Church from uh, Pius uh, the Twelfth. Antonio Ruffini was born in Rome, 1907, on the December 8th, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. He was named in honor of St. Anthony, the eldest of three boys, and lived in a devout family with a caring attitude toward the poor. His mother died when Antonio was very young. Antonio only had a primary school education, but from an early age, he prayed with his heart rather than from books. He had his first vision of Jesus and Mary when he was 17 years old. He saved his money and went to Africa to become a lay missionary. And again, just laying a foundation here because many people don't even know who this particular mystic is. This, this may be the first time that the majority of my guests have even heard about Antonio Ruffini. He stayed in Africa for over a year visiting all the villages. Much like Archbishop Lefebvre did, except he stayed longer. Entering the huts to take care of the sick and baptize the newborns. He went back to Africa a few more times and seemed to have the gift of xenoglossy, which is the ability to speak and understand foreign languages without ever having to study them. Padre Pio had this similar gift as well. He even knew the dialects of various tribes. He was also a healer in Africa. He would ask the people questions about their ailments, then God would heal them uh, with the herbal remedies that Antonio would find, boil, and hand out. He didn't know what he was doing. Everything was instic instinctive. Uh, and s basically, through word of mouth, people began to see him as a holy man, essentially. Now, the actual manifestation of the bloody stigmata that Antonio Ruffini acquired occurred on August the 12th, 1951, while returning from work as a representative uh, of a company of a wrapping paper along the Via Appia from Rome to Terracina in an old car. It was very hot, and apparently Ruffini was seized with unbearable thirst. After stopping the car, he went in search of a fountain he found shortly after. Suddenly, he saw a woman in the fountain barefoot uh, and covered in a cloak, which he believed to be a local peasant who also came to drink. So just as he arrived, she said, drink if you are thirsty, and added, how did you hurt? Ruffini, who approached uh, her hands like a cup to drink a sip of water, saw that the water changed into blood. Seeing this, Ruffini, without understanding what was happening, turned to the lady. She smiled at him and immediately began talking to him about God and his love for men. He was surprised to hear his truly sublime words, and in particular, those uh, references to the sacrifice of the cross. When the vision disappeared, Ruffini moved and delighted, walked to the car, but when he uh, tried to start, he noticed that on the back of the palms of his hands were opening up and appeared large bubbles of reddish blood uh, that began to shed as if it was bleeding. A few days later, he was suddenly awakened in the night by a loud noise from wind and rain and got up to close the window. But he saw to his astonishment that the sky was full of stars and the night was quiet. Uh, he remarked, uh, 
that there was uh, a little moisture, something unusual, noticed with a surprise that on the back of the soles of his feet had appeared uh, wounds, much like had appeared on his hands. From that time, Ruffini is given completely to men, charity, the sick, and spiritual assistance of just everyone in general. And this is what we need to do, folks. We need to be at the service of our neighbor. And you can give no greater charity as a Catholic right now by continuing to expose Vatican II, continuing to fight error, uh, and then also you know, other works of mercy is really getting out there and helping, uh, you know, the homeless, those in need, doing all those things that our Lord said that we need to do to demonstrate our faith. After Ruffini had the stigma on his hands for over 40 years, quite a significant amount of time, not nearly as much as Marie Julie Jeheni nor Padre Pio, but uh, quite close to that. As a matter of fact, there are several notable pictures of him with Padre Pio in the background. They went clear through his palms, uh, the stigmata, and has been examined by doctors who could offer no rational explanation. In spite of the fact that the wounds went clear through his hands, they never became infected. Venerable Pius XII authorized the blessing of a chapel on the spot where Ruffini received the stigmata on the Via Appia and Father Tomaselli, the miracle worker, wrote a booklet about him. Uh, Ruffini is also reported to have the gift of bilocation, similar to Padre Pio. After receiving the stigmata, Antonio became a member, member of the Third Order of St. Francis and took a vow of obedience. That's, that's pretty interesting, considering that Marie Julie Jeheni came from the same walk. Uh, very, very interesting. He was a very humble man. Whenever someone asked to see the stigmata, he would mumble a short prayer, kiss the crucifix, remove his gloves, and say, here they are. Jesus gave me these wounds, and if he wants, he can take them away. Now, building up to a point here, um, Father Kramer went on to, to talk how he knew Ruffini uh, specifically. This would be some years later that he would mention these comments. But he said, I myself knew Ruffini for many years. In the early 90s, Ruffini asked was asked point blank in his home, <clears throat> is John Paul II the Pope who's going to do the consecration of Russia? Ruffini answered back, no, it's not John Paul, and it will not be his immediate successor either, but the one after that. He is the one who will actually do the consecration of Russia. Now, Ruffini died at 92, and even in his deathbed, he stated boldly that the wounds in his hand, similar to Christ, had to uh, leave the nails for the crucifixion for it was God's gift. Now, this ties in with, you know, our narrative, if you will, uh, you know, my thesis particularly, and I know uh, Father Kramer, my former spiritual director, who, you know, we talk pretty often still, uh, time to time. We have the, you know, the basic uh, understanding that Francis is an anti-pope. So, you know, everyone will keep saying, oh, wow, well, then Francis will do it because he's the pope after Benedict the Sixteenth. Well, no, he's not. He's not the true pope. He's an anti-pope. So it's going to be Benedict the Sixteenth's successor. Uh, and this is what I've been saying even before, you know, coming into the knowledge of uh, Ruffini some years ago. But it fits that narrative of, Benedict, you know, after war basically starts, you know, after the civil unrest, after World War breaks out and uh, eventually you know as i mentioned benedict XVI will be on the run he'll be killed we know this from both the fatima message but then also other uh approved prophecy or revelations uh in catholic church history we will have a period of true state of a conte after Benedict the Sixteenth is killed, we'll have these minority of cardinals essentially have to set up a conclave elsewhere in Europe. As many of you know, where I have indicated that based upon the third secret of Fatima, wherein Our Lady said the dogma of faith will be preserved in Portugal. I suggest you pay attention to Fatima as it relates to the Catholic papacy, because obviously Rome is about to dogmatically lose the faith. The formalized New Age religion will absorb Rome. And that is not where the Catholic Church is going to be, visibly, at all, whatsoever. Can't hide behind that argument anymore. So the bottom line is, Benedict XVI's successor will do so, and it'll probably be sometime after that. I mean, when we're reading Catholic prophecy, 
it seems to suggest that we may be without a pope for a couple of years. It's, it's not like, okay, Benedict XVI dies. A couple of weeks later, we'll read in, in, in the newspaper somewhere that you know there, there's someone in Europe who is stating to be pope. Because you got to remember now with the, with the mainstream media, I mean, they're really going to spin this thing nastily. And you're going to have a false prophet character show up here in Rome, who, by the way, is not going to want to be called a pope. But just knowing the stup- stupidity of our hour, we're going to see a lot of people actually fall uh, for the notion that he is, you know, some sort of pope over the church. Bottom line is, we could be. It could be, uh, you know, two years, 24 months before that consecration of Russia. And obviously that would be one of the first things that uh, the next true pope does after Benedict XVI. And do I know, I, I get asked this all the time, do I think Benedict XVI knows he's the Pope of Fatima? Absolutely. During the first few weeks, if I'm not mistaken, of when Benedict XVI uh, started his papacy, we had him making mention of him asking people to pray for him so that he didn't flee for the fear of the wolves. I mean, he, he knew this St. Gallian Mafia, which came out publicly and say they ran him out of town, which per canon law makes his quote-unquote resignation invalid. Can't force a po- pope out under duress and then claim his successor, if you will, to be a true pope. He simply isn't. Francis is not a true pope. That's one of the arguments we use. We have other arguments, as you know. Um, bottom line is folks, it's very, very important to kind of tie this whole knot that you continue to pray daily, at least do one decade of your rosary daily for the consecration of Russia. I know everyone's sitting back now and, you know, everything doesn't seem to be as bad as Eric makes it to be. Well, guess what? Everyone is going to be affected. There's going to be more and more false flags after the economic collapse uh, we'll have a water crisis, we'll have a famine crisis. There needs to be all kinds of crises going on so that people can be looking forth with their carnal eyes to a new Messiah into the world. And this is exactly what the Jews want. The Jews didn't want a spiritual uh, Christ, if you will, to rule over them. They wanted a, 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 a messianic figure that would be more crass and materialistic. And this is what it's all about. It's all about economics. When you see, when you hear the Vatican II popes talk about this new world order, which is the same new world order that the secular world is talking about, I always find it comical when they say, "Oh, well, no, they're talking about you know the Christian new world order." I mean, really? Like, are you that much of a doofus? Uh, they're always talking about how it's based upon economics. It has nothing to do with the social kingship of Christ. What's interesting to note, you'll find similar language with the communist views. The communists literally call this uh, new age to come or new period. They call it the new era. Or they call it the civilization of love. Literally. And guess what's been coming out of the Vatican II Pope's mouth, including Benedict XVI and including John Paul II. Got to call a spade a spade on that one, folks. Bottom line is we've got to continue to pray for the consecration of Russia because this is what Our Lady uh, asked us to do. Of course, I cannot stress her role in these times, uh, certainly on an individual level for conversions for individual souls, but how about for nations? What's going to happen here in America? Do Americans literally think with all of the heresy that has been coming from this country? The reality is that our country was never Christian, folks. We were founded in Freemasonic principles, uh, religious liberty, which ultimately went over to Vatican II, as Archbishop Lefebvre noted, which is a heresy, which runs contrary to the Catholic social teaching on the social kingship of Christ. That is, it's either Catholic or it's nothing by way of a Catholic rite. Other heresies from this country, uh, uh, separation of church and state, Americanism, liberty of conscience, freedom of press and freedom of speech actually are Masonic concepts as well. They're not Catholic concepts at all. Turn over your dollar bill, folks, and take a look at the back. Novus Ordo Seclorum. And you'll see the all-seeing eye as it relates to the New World Order. It begs to ask the question, what God are we talking about when these Freemasons and, and, and Deists and other uh, knucklehead started our country 
What God are they talking about? Are they talking about the Holy Trinity? Or the Freemasonic, quote-unquote, God who is Lucifer? So many people sit back in this Protestant Zionist world and think, you know, USA, Britain, and Israel are the good guys. Uh, no, 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 no. You will notice how Our Lady said peace comes through Russia eventually. There's no mention of America. So my point is, Americans, what are we going to do? Are we going to start promoting the message of Fatima? Are we going to start telling our Protestant and heretical neighbors, hey, listen, it's getting down to crunch time. That's why I always advocate, you know, Our Lady and people can run their mouths as much as they want. I say this very bluntly, the vast majority of people are not going to be around in a decade. God gives warnings. He will give an ultimate warning, in my opinion, before the three days of darkness even arises. And mankind will have to choose. Again, as it relates to this specific warning, the two stars colliding, this other star which will come behind it, which will usher in Antichrist, uh, Maitreya, Wow, are we talking five years away? Again, this is what they're saying. I'm not saying it's infallible, but they seem to have timelines down. I mean, they know when this Planet X system is inbound. They obviously have knowledge which is far, far more advanced than we can ever imagine. Such the times we live in, folks. We have all of these signs that our Lord talked about both in Luke 21 and Matthew 24. People keep saying, you know, we're about to enter the apocalypse, the book of Revelation. We're already in it, folks. We just haven't hit certain portions of it yet. Even Sister Lucia, when asked about the third secret of Fatima, made mention of that. Okay? We're in it. Bottom line is, we have to turn back to Our Lady. We have to turn back to the church. We have to turn back to the true faith. We have to continue to pray for true unity, not the Vatican II conciliar church's notion of unity. And that is... You are good as is, and you're in the church already. Nope. Sorry, Mr. Atheist. Sorry, Mr. Heretic. Sorry, Schismatic. Yes, I'm a nutty traditionalist, a.k.a. simply Catholic, folks. Very few Catholics remain in this world. True sign that the Antichrist is on the horizon. I encourage you all to go to YouTube, type in Tradcat Knight Maitreya, and... View some of my videos on him so you can get an understanding of what we're about to uh, run into in the not-so-distant future. We essentially have to wrap things up now as we're just about approaching that hour-and-a-half mark. I apologize for going over the hour, but I hope you all enjoyed this particular broadcast. Tomorrow I got on Dabu7. Wow, he's got something like 300,000 subscribers on his YouTube. Again, he's not Catholic, but he provides a lot of good analysis and kind of is a foot soldier, if you will, uh, in the alternative news outlet. I mean, he goes to a lot of these uh, anti-Soros protests and mix it up, mixes it up with people right there on the ground. Got a lot of great footage. You can go to YouTube, type in Dabu7, D-A-H-B-O-O-7, and get to his work. He's already been on once. And we, you know, my talk with him did quite well. I enjoy talking to uh, Dabu7. He's been featured. Uh, all over the alternative news uh, media, if you will. And it should be another blockbuster talk with him. Lining up special guests for February. If you have special guest suggestions, send them to me at apostleofmary at hotmail.com. And again, as we continue to grow, we should be able to get bigger and bigger names. We've already had some really big names on already, but... Still many people scared to come on to this show, folks. I can't tell you how, how many times I've received, you know, private messages. And I, I try to leave out their names for the most part. Uh, but, you know, even some certain people from Fox um, and other big names, you know, on the basis of, of your positions on, you know, whether it's I'm an anti-Zionist or you're just a traditional Catholic or whatever. They, they, they want to stay away from uh, our website, which is fine. Again, I mean, I'm very up blunt with people. Unless you convert, you're going to stand no chance by way of salvation. And God is going to have to clean the table clean, if you will, in order for us to reestablish a truly 
Catholic society, not a Freemasonic universalist new tower of Babel city of man society that has been happening since Vatican II. And there is a big difference. And you better know the difference for the sake of your own salvation. Again, if you have any questions, like to set up a phone chat, Skype chat, uh, send me a message at Apostle of Mary at hotmail.com. Please uh, get behind this apostolate by way of financial, if you will, cash, check, or money order inquiries can be sent to Apostle of Mary at Hotmail.com. I'll get back to you with the mailing address. Need more help in that area, folks. Again, we're in an information war. Continue to pray for that consecration of Russia. And having said all of the things that I said today, lest I be considered uncharitable and mean and nasty, uh, you have to continue to pray for people like uh, Francis, for Protestants, for people following Vatican II, okay, don't walk around with, uh, you know, uh, you know, being a snob in that sense. You should be highly compassionate. Uh, I was at one point stuck in Vatican II. I graduated from a highly charismatic Novus Ordo school, Franciscan University. It was kind of interesting. Many of their professors are waking up and agreeing with me privately. They'll say Benedict XVI was uh, teaching heresy. They'll say, you know, Francis is a, a heretic. Okay, they won't say it publicly, we'll say it privately. But then I've had a lot of friends who I graduated with who are now, unfortunately, some of them are state of a contest. I, I don't go to that level and suggest to you that there is no Pope. I do believe Benedict XVI is the true Pope who will give way, if you will, to the Holy Pope to come and this great restoration to come during the tribulation and there and after. My good friends, thank you for tuning in. Again, you could hear my talks and see my articles all throughout alternative media, including Veterans Today. I want to thank them again. If you'd like to be a sponsor for Trad Cat Night or do some advertising on Trad Cat Night, contact me for some rates. I offer very lucrative rates. And again, we are a top 20,000 website. We have a lot of traffic running through our page on a daily basis. And so, my good friends, in closing, let us say a prayer and ask Our Lady for those graces for today, for our own salvation, for our family members to awaken in this hour, for us to take our salvation in, in, in general just seriously again, uh, to pray for our country, whether you think or whatever you think about Trump. And again, I'm not on the Trump train. I do believe that he's an NWO agent who's just playing his part in making it making it seem alternative media is making it seem uh like he's uh not on the globalist side but we equate zionism to globalism and he is a zionist so zionist equals globalist to me he is a globalist even though he says he's a nationalist and a lot of great signs are coming from him Let, let's call a spade a spade a lot of good things have been happening uh the past 72 hours even with certain executive orders. The bottom line is, what I'm trying to get to, is you, you've got to pray for him no matter what, no matter what side of the fence you are on with Trump. And you have to, we have to now pray for a hierarchy which will lead us in truth. Obviously, we're not getting the truth, as Archbishop Lefebvre said, and that's all he wanted. The found, We have to remember, the founder of society was far more blunt than the new SSPX is making him out to be. They, they really are sugarcoating him, and he had some really blunt words uh for the popes uh for the council and he made it very clear folks cannot shake hands with the enemy we don't want to be recognized we want them to convert it's about principle and if you're not about principle we ain't talking how about that in close my good friends keep your wings spread in faith and hope keep your eyes wide in charity continue to keep me in prayer and until next time stay safe and god bless